This afternoon, the governor will talk about his vision and plan for this year and how to build upon the progress and continued improved, and, and continue to improve the economy here in New York State. For the first time in decades, towns and cities throughout New York are seeing state government function. With two consecutive years of on-time budgets, I was in Albany for 14 years governor, we had two in 14 years, uh, the, go the governor has been able to deal with budget gaps with no new taxes. Governor Cuomo and the legislature have transformed Albany into a national model of effective and efficient government. The governor has also made unprecedented investments in communities across our state. From the regional economic development councils that have fostered real sustainable economic growth in all of New York's 10 regions, to signing into law responsible and comprehensive gun control legislation that will make our state the safest in the nation. The governor has shown that he is making Albany work for the people of Clarkstown, Rockland, and all of New York State. Finally, the governor's administration has done more for localities in the last two years than the past administrations have done in the past 20 years. By helping counties cover the cost of Medicaid growth and supporting municipalities with Tier 6 pension reform and also bringing, uh, taking that burden off of towns like Clarkstown and to his new arbitration proposal, the governor has proven that cities, towns, and village of, villages of New York have a true friend and partner in Albany. Now it is my honor and privilege to introduce the governor of the great state of New York, Governor Andrew Cuomo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Clarkstown. How are we doing today? It is a good day. It's great to be back in Rockland. Great to be back with so many friends. First, to Alex Gromack, who did great service in Albany, but he's doing a great, great job here in Clarkstown. Let's give him a round of applause. And to Harriet Cornell, and to Christopher St. Lawrence, and Howard Phillips, let's give them a round of applause. All the local officials, all the community leaders, it's my pleasure to be back in Rockland. It's actually my pleasure to be out of, Al be out of Albany, first of all. But it's a pleasure to be here with you, uh, and to talk about the state of the state, and the state budget, and plans for the state for the coming year. The beginning of the year, it's customary for the chief executive to lay out a broad vision for uh, what that, that subdivision. The governor does, a governor does the state of the state, a mayor does the state of the city. Tonight we'll hear from the president, Barack Obama, who will do a state of the union address, which is what is the state of that government? What are the problems we have and, and what is the path forward? That's the state of the state. The budget then comes a couple of weeks later, and the budget is the nuts and bolts. It's the meat on the bones, if you will. Here are the, here's the actual dollars and cents of, of where we're going to put our resources. When you put the two together, it gives you the roadmap forward. The, traditionally, you present the state of the state and the budget to the legislature. The president tonight will present to a joint session of Congress. I present it to the Assembly and the Senate. But I like to do it a little differently because I don't really work for the Assembly and the Senate. I don't really work for the politicians in Albany. I work for you. So I wanted to bring this presentation here today so you can hear it. And I want your feedback. I want to know what you think. Uh, and if you support it, I want you to go to your local officials and tell them you support it. We've had a good couple of years, uh, as you heard in uh, Mr. Gromack's introduction. We have a good couple of years in the state. I think the secret to why the state is doing better and why the legislature is functioning better is because the people have made their voice heard over the past two years. I think that's the difference. Uh, and for me, this is the relationship that matters. You know, they talk about priorities in life uh, and keeping the priority relationship strong. This is the priority relationship for me. So I wanted to talk to you about this and see what you think. 
We call the, this year's, the theme for this year's State of the State is New York Rising. We've had a lot of tough issues in the state. Uh, but the government is working. The government is working better than ever before. And I believe we're going to rebuild from these situations to, a, to an even greater height. The past few months has, you've seen a blizzard of, of stories and a blizzard of events. And I think first we have to get our bearings with uh, all of these events, some good, some bad. And to start thinking two years ago is when I became governor, and I said two years ago that we were going to have to chart a different course for this state, that we were at a crossroads, and that many parts of this state for decades were in decline, parts of the Hudson Valley, upstate New York, losing jobs, losing businesses, losing young people who were going to airports to find uh, other places to live, that we had to turn that around and we had to start a New York comeback. And the core elements were getting the economy to work. It was about good jobs. Al Samuels is here. The engine of the economy is creating those jobs, getting that business economy working so that there's opportunity for everyone, creating a world-class education system, establishing that the state is a state of financial integrity and financial responsibility, and to restore New York as the progressive capital of the nation. Because New York is not just another state. It's the state, and it's the progressive capital, and other states look to the state of New York. Over the past two years, we've made significant progress. Governor Al Smith, who was a great governor of New York, used to say, let's look at the record. Well, let's look at the record over the past two years. The mentality, operating mentality of the state has changed. It's no longer a bureaucratic culture. We've replaced it with a new culture called entrepreneurial government. That doesn't have to be an oxymoron. Government can be entrepreneurial, lean and creative and, and starting new ideas and new businesses. Gone is the tax capital mentality. The answer to everything in New York was always raise taxes. Government had a shortfall, raise taxes. You have a new idea for a new program, raise taxes. You can't be the tax capital of the nation if you want businesses coming here to New York. They will leave. We've been talking about the mobility of business, the mobility of people. It's true. If you're going to charge more taxes than any other state, they will leave this state and they will go to greener pastures. And we have to realize that once and for all. We change that. We changed that culture, and it's not just the perception. We've changed the reality of it. We passed a property tax cap because you can't keep raising local property taxes. You're taxing people right out of their homes. We passed Tier 6, which is a pension reform plan that brings down the costs of pensions because they are unsustainable for local governments going forward. And we reduced middle-class taxes. This is for people making up to $300,000 per year. We reduced the tax rate for the middle class to the lowest level in 58 years, believe it or not. And we stopped the political gridlock. We said, look, yes, we're Democrats and we're Republicans, but we are New Yorkers first. And it's time we start acting like New Yorkers and not playing politics and moving this state forward and getting the government to work for the people of this state and the people of our districts. And, and we have a government now in Albany that is actually working for the people once again. We set out, you should applaud that. We set out to bridge a divide and bridge a number of divides. We set out to build a bridge from yesterday to tomorrow, from what was to what can be, from the dysfunction of Albany to the performance of Albany, from the cynicism of the public that was skeptical about a government to restoring trust in government and restoring trust in people, breaking the political gridlock to come up with a government where people could actually cooperate and make a government work. And that was symbolic but it was also literal as well as metaphorical because we went out to build a bridge and we are literally building a bridge. We're building a new Tap and Z bridge.
And you know, this bridge is it's both physical and it is symbolic. We were just chatting about it inside. And you know, for so long, people have talked about what government can't do and, and government is slow and government always finds a reason not to act. We started talking about the Tappan Zee Bridge literally one year ago is when I proposed it in my state of the state. Just about one year ago now. And in one year, one year, we came up with the plans, we got the environmental approvals done, we got the federal approvals done, we put out a contract for bid, we picked a contractor, and we're beginning construction in one year after government had talked about this for 10 years, hundreds of meetings, millions of dollars spent in meetings and planning, and actually nothing happened. And in one year, we are now literally building the bridge. So you know what this bridge says to me? Enough talking about what we can't do and all the problems we have and all the issues we have. When we put our mind to something, we can still make it happen. We are still the great state of New York, and don't you ever forget it. And when you see that bridge going up, you remember that. So we've, got, we've, we've done a lot, and we've not made a lot of progress. I'd like to say, well, we're all done. Everything is finished. Not quite. We have more to do. The national economy is still not doing what it needs to do, and we're feeling it here in this state. The economy is not as strong as it needs to be. Being the progressive capital, Fighting for justice is a fight that continues every day. It's a journey. It is not a destination. Our children in the state are not being educated to the best of their capacity. And Mother Nature has not been kind to us, and she left us some work to do. So let us begin. New York's one-two punch is about jobs and education getting the economy running because the economy is the engine that pulls the train. We talked about our New York Open for Business campaign, which is a different attitude, a different perception for business. The macro effort is making this state a state of fiscal integrity and changing the perception of this state by changing the reality. Alex talked about the state just not passing a budget. For years, the state just never passed a budget on time, and it became a joke. You'd come to budget time, a budget's supposed to be done by April 1, they would start the politics, they would start gridlock, and the budget would be late, and then it would be five days late and ten days late, and it became a symbol for the confusion and the chaos and just the ineffectiveness of government. And the business community especially looked at this late budget every year, and it became typical of the fact that the state of New York just didn't work, couldn't get its act together. So we said, you know what, we're going to clean up our act, we're going to clean up our own house, and we're going to get the budget done, and we're going to get the budget done on time. And we passed the budget on time for two years in a row, and we said we're going to do it again this year, three years in a row, to get the budget passed, get it passed on time, and with a pledge to New Yorkers that we're going to do it without raising taxes, period. There will be no new taxes in this budget, and we're going to get it passed on time. We've done it before, we have to do it again. We have a $1.3 billion deficit for the state's budget. $1.3 billion sounds like a lot of money. It is a lot of money. But last year, we had a $3 billion deficit. The year before that, we had a $10 billion deficit. So compared to where we've been, this is OK and this is manageable. If we hadn't done what we did, the deficit would have been that top line, the white line. We would have had a $17 billion deficit. But because we balanced our books the first two years, it's down to a $1.3 billion deficit. How are we going to close the deficit? We're going to take savings and efficiencies out of state government. We're not going to pass on the cut to local government. We're not going to pass it on to not-for-profits. And we're not going to pass it on to the taxpayer. We're going to manage our state government better than before, and we're going to make up the deficit uh, all within that regard. Second step in b building a better business community and creating jobs is we started two years ago a regional approach, approach to economic development, 
Meaning what? Meaning they used to talk about, well, what is the state's economic development plan? How do you improve the economy in the state? The problem is there is no New York State economy. There are regional economies, depending on where you are in the state. We have one economy in New York City. You have a different economy in Buffalo. You have a different economy on Long Island. So there was no one, one top-down approach. If you want to build the economy, you have to build the regional economies. You want to build the Rockland economy, you have to build it in Rockland and the Hudson Valley and your neighbors. That's where that economy is going to come from. The state can be a partner, but you have to in realize that individual regional approach. And that's what we've been doing for the past two years. It has been working very well. The, uh, this region won a very big competitive regional economic development grant uh, to provide jobs and attract businesses. The overall economic challenge for this state is going to be in this area called tech transfer, technology transfer, which means what? Which means when you look at the economies that are succeeding around the country, around the world actually, there's a common denominator, which are the schools of higher education, the higher academic institutions, are teaching young people, coming up with great innovative tech-related ideas. And those tech-related ideas then become businesses. And it's the next iPad, it's the next telephone, it's the next software system. And that's what's been driving the economy. New York currently loses in that situation. It's not that we don't come up with the ideas, because we do come up with the ideas. We have the best schools in the country, and we get the best research grants and more than almost any other state. And we generate the ideas, but they go to other states to become businesses, which goes back to the first problem, which is we have this anti-business perception. So we have these young, brilliant people coming up with great ideas, and then they go to California to capitalize the business, or to Massachusetts, or to Texas, or to North Carolina. That's what has to stop. And we're starting this year a program called Innovation Hotspots, which is partnerships between colleges, higher academic institutions, and private businesses where, when, that will incubate startup businesses. So when we come up with one of these new ideas, we will have a place for them, literally a physical space. We will house these startup businesses. We'll give them the support services, the lawyers, the accountants, whatever they need in terms of support. We'll invest in those startup companies as a state of New York, and they will be tax-free zones. No taxes whatsoever for those businesses that are in these incubators. And there's one condition, one provision, that they start the business, they succeed the business, the business stays in New York, and they hire New Yorkers. If we birth it, we keep it here in New York. We also have to be saying to the business community that's here already, we understand that the cost of doing business is too high. They will all talk about the cost of workers' comp and unemployment insurance. We're going to overhaul those two systems, and we're actually going to reduce the cost $1.3 billion, which will be passed on to business directly. Another challenge we have is training the workforce for the jobs that we have. Our workforce training is from a different era. It's where we had a manufacturing economy and we had a generic worker training program thinking that then you could go out and find a job with a common set of skills. That's what our community colleges now do in the SUNY system and the CUNY system. But generic job training doesn't work anymore. We need what's called a job linkage program. And we have an opportunity because jobs are now coming back from overseas. You know, we went through a phase where these corporations all wanted cheap labor, and they moved overseas to find cheap labor. Well, you know what they found out when they moved overseas? They got what they paid for. <laughs> they wanted cheap labor, they got cheap labor. But the cheap labor doesn't have the skill set they need. It doesn't have the skills to operate the machine. 
doesn't have the skill set to really build the product. So those companies are now coming back. And that's an opportunity for us. They're bringing those high-skilled jobs back here. But that is an opportunity if we're ready. There are 210,000 unfilled jobs in the state of New York today. 210,000. Because our people don't have the skill set to fill those jobs. These are highly technical jobs. And either you have that skill set or you don't. We have the jobs. We know the skill set. We just have to flip our model uh, 180 degrees. Find the employer first. Identify the job. Identify the skill set. And then have the community college train for that job specifically. And say to that person, you come to this community college course, you learn, you graduate, we will place you in that job period. It's the new age apprentice program where you're bringing people in, giving them the skill they need to fit that very particular job with that identification. That's what we're gonna do with our community college system and we're gonna start it this year. Once you... Once you have a person in the job, you have to make sure the job pays a decent wage. Teddy Roosevelt spoke about this. Great governor, great president. No man can be a good citizen unless he has a wage more than sufficient to cover the bare cost of living. If Teddy Roosevelt said that today, he would say no man or woman can be a good citizen unless he or she has a good wage. The state sets the minimum wage. State law sets a minimum wage. Today, the minimum wage comes out to $14,600 per year if you work in a minimum wage job. So what does that mean? $14,600, the annual cost of gasoline is $1,200. Of electricity is $1,300. Of auto insurance is $1,400. Of groceries, $6,500, assuming you want to eat. Child care, $10,000. Cost of housing is $15,000, in and of itself more than the minimum wage. I'm saying to the legislature that this just doesn't add up. The minimum wage in our state is out of pace with the minimum wage in neighboring states. We propose raising the minimum wage to $8.75 an hour because it's the right thing to do, it's the fair thing to do, and it is long overdue, and we should do it now. We're also going to be much more aggressive about marketing New York business. We have a story in New York that we just haven't told yet, and Market New York is going to be a new multifaceted market program to bolster economic growth. First, we're going to tell the story of the products that we make here in New York, which people don't even realize. We have a great wine industry. We have a great beer industry. We have a great dairy industry, cheeses and milk and yogurt. And we want to market New York's product, and we're going to do it under the Taste New York program, which will aggressively market New York State products. We're going to create duty-free shops all across the state as a way to introduce people to New York products where you can come in, see the New York products, buy them uh, in a duty-free atmosphere. We're also going to challenge the regions to come up with their own marketing campaign for their own region. We have such beauty and history and depth in this state, and we just haven't told the story. Right now you have county tourism agencies all across the state, and we're going to challenge those county tourism agencies to work together as a region, come up with a way to market your region, and we will partner with the most competitive marketing plans across the state. You have from Western New York, you have a beautiful story about the Niagara Falls and that entire Western New York region, and you go to the Finger Lakes, the Thousand Islands, Hudson Valley. I mean, we have such history. If we just told the story, we'd get more tourism, and that's big economic development. I also... I'm also supporting casinos in the state of New York as part of a resort destination complex. Now, casinos technically 
New York State is not now in the casino business. Why? Because our state constitution prohibits New York from being in the casino business, the gaming business. So what we did a few years ago was because we couldn't go into the casino business, the state authorized racinos. What are racinos? Racinos are casinos with an R. That's what a racino is. <laughs> so we are in, technically in the racino business, but we're not in the casino business. Only the government officials in Albany know that they're in the racino business and not in the casino business. Everybody else thinks that they're going to a casino, and we have them all across the state, and they call themselves casinos, and people go there to gamble. They don't know that they're really not in a casino, even though the sign says casino, that they're really in a racino, so it's sort of like this little secret that we have going on in the state. But because we're not in the casino business, we don't regulate them as casinos, we don't tax them as casinos, and we don't really have the results and the product that we would have from being in the casino business. And we have 17 that are currently located all across the state, plus all the other states are in the casino business, and they are stealing business from our state. And our people are going to Connecticut, and they're going to Philadelphia, and they're going to Jersey, and they're going to Atlantic City. Why shouldn't they stay here in this state, and why shouldn't that uh, product be in this state? So I want to propose a casino gaming plan that would have a referendum that would allow us to change the Constitution, to actually go into the gaming business that we are already in, frankly, but uh, to use these casinos as the heart of a resort destination that can spur regional economic growth. You know, we have 50 million tourists coming to New York City. We have 9 million people in New York City. We have to get that traffic north. We have to get those tourism dollars north. We have to say to the people in New York City, you want a vacation, you don't have to go to Pennsylvania, Connecticut, anywhere else. It's all here in New York. Come to Rockland, come to the Hudson Valley, come north, see what we have here in this state. You know, the orientation in New York City is east-west. They go to Pennsylvania, they go to Long Island, they go to the Hamptons. We want to say, think north, think north, change your compass. And I think having a, casort, a casino resort destination would be the kind of attraction that could get that traffic starting to come north. Once they start to come north, they will continue coming. So I've proposed phase one for casino development, which is three casinos, all upstate, uh, and as parts of resort destinations. I told the legislature I will only support it if it is non-political. I want it independent of the political process. I don't want to be involved in a politicized casino gaming process. Let's keep it independent. But there are real jobs for New York here, and that's what this is all about. Second priority was education. It's always been a top priority for government. I have two words for education. We have to do more, and we have to do better. Secretary of <laughs> Secretary of Education touched a very important point. First of all, this country is out of step with other countries in that other countries just educate their children more than we do, just more. We still have a schedule that is based on an agrarian economy where we give our children off during the summer because we need them to work the fields. That's where the calendar actually came from. Other countries are just educating their children more. And that's why you see kids from across the globe excelling where our kids are not. And our children are going to be competing with them in the future. This is a global marketplace. And the, the, the kids today are going to be on the internet, on the computer system, competing with kids from other countries that who frankly right now have more education and better education, and we have to catch up. More learning time is part of it. Well, how do you have more learning time? There's three options. You can have a longer school day. You can have a longer school year. 
less summer vacation, etc. Or you can have a combination of both. I feel very strongly that more learning time is right. It is also going to be controversial and it's going to be difficult. Uh, to extend the school day has a lot of ramifications. Parents have now planned their life around the school day and kids have afternoon activities. A longer school year, shorter summer vacation also has ramifications. So what I propose is this. There are 700 school districts across the state. I want to leave it to all 700 and say, look, it's, it's your option. Whatever the local school district, school district wants to do. You want to have a longer day? God bless you. You want to have a longer year? God bless you. You want to do nothing? God bless you. But I encourage you to do more learning time. And as an encouragement, if a school district does more, longer day or longer year, the state will pay 100 cents on the dollar for that longer day or longer year. But that is the way for the future, and that is where we have to go. Same is true for early education. All the numbers are clear. If a child receives pre-K, they do better. They do better scholastically. They do better in life. We should have real pre-K for all our children in this state. We also talk about education in distressed communities. We've been having this argument for a lot of years. Why does a school in a poor community uh, have issues that a school in a rich community doesn't have? It is because, my friends, we're talking about apples and oranges. A school in a poor community has to perform functions that a school in a rich community does not have to perform. The teacher in a school in a poor community is not just a teacher. That teacher is a teacher often a parent substitute, often a mentor, a counselor, a nutritionist, because many of those children don't have the same support structure that the kids in the richer communities do. Recognize that disparity. And instead of trying to compare the two, recognize that a school in a poorer community has more work to do than a school in a rich community. And give that school the support that it needs. Give it the education, give it the social service. We call them community schools because you're not just doing education, you're doing community development, you're doing personal development, and wrap those services around the children so that school actually has a chance to succeed and call it for what it is. Well, economic development and education are the engine there's more to the state of New York than that. New York is also the equality capital of the nation. It's who we are. It is, what, it is what this room today looks like. We were more diverse than anyone else. We were more diverse first, and we had to figure it out. And we feel very strongly about the model that we set and the rule that we hold that we are all here and we are all equal. And this state has held that banner up for other states to follow for many, many years. Well, if we're serious about equality, and if we're serious about being honest about discrimination, and if we're serious about being honest about problems of people who are left behind, and inequalities and inequities that still exist in society, then let's take a good look in the mirror and look at our society and see where the inequity still exists, and let's address that inequity. These two babies were born in the same hospital on the same day at the same time. They will both go home to loving families and good homes. They will attend good schools, get the same grades, and earn the same degree. They will enter the same profession, but their lives will be much different. One will earn, on average, $11,000 less per year and $500,000 less over a lifetime. The other is 32 times more likely to become a CEO or serve on a corporate board. One is five times more likely to be sexually harassed or become a victim of domestic violence. 
and more than twice as likely to be a victim of housing or lending discrimination. One is twice as likely to become a single parent living in poverty, and twice as likely to live out old age in poverty. Why? Because one is a girl. It's not right. It's not fair. It's time for a women's equality. Two years ago, we passed marriage equality that stopped discrimination and resonated across this nation. Let's this year make history again and let's pass a Women's Equality Act. This is the birthplace of women's suffrage. We have a 10-point women's equality agenda. First, shatter the glass ceiling, a real pay equity law in this state that says a woman should get paid dollar for dollar what a man gets paid for the same job with the same skill set. Women now get paid 77 cents to a man's dollar. That's wrong. That has to stop. Zero tolerance for sexual harassment. Strengthen employment lending and credit discrimination laws. Strengthen human trafficking laws end family status discrimination, prevent landlords from discriminating against women, stop discrimination against victims of domestic violence, pregnancy discrimination, protect victims of domestic violence by order of protection laws, and protect a woman's right to choose. That is our women's equality agenda. Another issue that we have to address, another societal issue, is the issue of gun violence. If, if you haven't seen or you haven't heard about the issue and the problems of gun violence, frankly, you're turning a blind eye or a deaf ear to society. It is everywhere. It is a chronic problem. It has been for years and years and years. We saw it in Newtown, Connecticut. We saw it in Webster, New York. We saw it in Columbine. But we have seen it on and off chronically for decades. I know it is a difficult issue, but it is something we have to do. We have to take action to prevent. We passed a gun policy, a gun law, the first day of the legislative, legislative session. That is reasonable. It's measured. It's balanced. It respects hunters and sportsmen but it ends the unnecessary risk of high-capacity assault weapons. It keeps guns from criminals and the mentally ill. It bans assault weapons. It closes the private sector loophole, private sale loophole on background checks. It enacts tougher penalties for illegal guns. And it has what's called the Webster provision, which is a mandatory life sentence for killing a first responder, which is what happened in Webster, New York. I know this is a difficult issue. It's a controversial issue. Uh, I know the feelings of gun owners are very strong, and the feeling about the Second Amendment is very strong. I'm a gun owner myself. I don't believe this has anything to do with the legitimate ownership of guns. I understand, however, uh, the, the political controversy. And I want to praise publicly the members of this New York State Legislature in the Assembly and the Senate who stood up and voted for this New York Safe Act. New York is the first state in the nation to have a bill like this. I applaud their courage. It was a long time in coming, but they've acted responsibly, and I applaud them. And last but not least, we have to respond to the crisis, and we have to respond to what Mother Nature dealt us, and we actually have two crises to respond to. One is, Storm Irene and Storm Lee, which happened back in 2011, but which is still a problem for communities all across the state. And one is Hurricane Sandy just, that just happened on October 29th. And first, we have to start by learning from what happened. There is a fact that we have to accept, which is that climate change is real. It is inarguable. It is a scientific fact. 
but that the sea is warmer and there is a changing weather pattern. We now have 100-year storms every three days. I spend half my job in a uh, pair of dungarees being a uh, disaster response coordinator. I've responded to about three or four real emergency crises in my two years. My father was governor for 12 years, never reported to one. So there is something that is going on. And we have to recognize that. And when you say that this is a situation that is going to recur, then it takes you to a different place in determining what you're going to do now. We have to make the government work. It has to work faster and better and smarter than ever before. And I don't want to just rebuild what was there before. I want to rebuild smarter, and I want to rebuild better. If we have houses... If we have houses that are in places that tend to flood, then let's rebuild them in a way that can actually deal with the floods and the damage when it comes. There are all sorts of architectural measures. I'd rather spend a little bit more and build the house right than build the house every two years. That's the Recreate New York Smart Home Program. There are also places that Mother Nature really owns, and land that Mother Nature owns. And there are some people who have rebuilt their home two, three, four times in the past five, six years. If people want to decide that they want to move out and they want to buy out and sell their home because they're tired of rebuilding, I want to offer them a buyout program that says, if you want to move, we'll pay you for the price of the home. God bless you. We'll leave the parcel vacant, and you can find somewhere else to live. It's their choice. But again, it's smarter than rebuilding that home every few years, every time there's a flood. We have to harden our infrastructure uh, and build our roads in those flood areas, the places where you know there's going to be a storm with a different design. Our airports, it can't be every time there's a storm, it shuts down an airport for two weeks. Our fuel delivery system. Remember all the chaos during Sandy on the gas lines, etc.? We had weeks of chaos from stopping delivery for a day and a half. That was just a day and a half of reduction in delivery, and it caused pandemonium because there's no reserve system. When there's an electrical out, when the, when the electricity is down, the gasoline pumps stop. When the electricity is down, the fuel delivery stops because the whole system is pumped. It can't be. And we have to redesign our fuel delivery system, our utility system. It can't be every time the wind blows, a tree falls, a line comes down, and everybody's in the dark for weeks. We have to have a world-class emergency response mechanism that understands this is a new reality and has the training and the capacity to deal with it. Otherwise, people will lose lives. I really believe that, and we have to have the best, in the, uh, best on the planet, period. We have to capitalize on the New York spirit of volunteerism, and I want to organize a volunteer corps so we know who's prepared to help, who's equipped to help, and have them ready to deploy when we need them. And I also want to empower communities to come up with their own reconstruction plans. Uh, the state can do some things, the federal government can do some things, but this is also an individual activity, and let's empower the local community to organize themselves, come up with their own reconstruction plan, and we'll fund their plan and their vision. These will be the eligible communities for the reconstruction from Irene and Lee, and obviously Hurricane Sandy is uh, New York City and Long Island. And the good news is we did get, we were successful in getting $30 billion from Congress for reconstruction. And $30 billion is still a lot of money, and we can do a lot of good with this, and I'm excited about that. The best news, though, is that we are New Yorkers. Um, and let me close on this. The storm and what we went through was in some ways uh, very damaging uh, and caused a lot of pain and caused a lot of grief. Hurricane Sandy, 300,000 people's homes significantly damaged. We've never gone through anything like that before. 
the Irene and Lee storms. You had lives devastated, devastated. Entire communities just washed away. Uh, we've seen some of the most bleak conditions we've seen in a long time. But I also believe that there was a silver lining in all these situations that is going to make us stronger than before. Because maybe it took a traumatic, a difficult episode to really give us a little shake and to say to us, hey, focus on what's important and remember who you are and remember what we do at our best. And what we do at our best is we come together like no other people anywhere on this globe. Because we are New Yorkers. And we are there for one another. And yes, we are black and white and brown and we're Asian and we're Jewish and we're Italian. But at the end of the day, we're all New Yorkers. And we come together and we're not just going to rebuild after these storms. And this year is not just going to be a reconstruction year. This is going to be a year where we re rebuild this state better and stronger and safer and smarter than ever before. And we're going to build a state that we leave to our kids that is better than the state that we inherited from our parents. Because that's what this is all about at the end of the day. You have a very short period of time where, when you're on this earth. And there's one question when you leave it. Did you leave the place better than you found it? Did you make this place a better place? Did you help people while you were there? And we're going to leave our children a home in the state of New York that is better, stronger, richer, and safer than any state on this nation. That is my commitment to you, and that is what we will do together. Thank you, and God bless you.